This video is about a posting that Franco Bruno Cordelletti of Brazil pointed out to me. He's an administrator of the space on Quora called Electrical Science. And um, a William Beatty, B E A T Y, had posted an article or an answer to a question, and Franco uh, brought it to my attention and it was very mind stimulating <laughs> and it got me to rework the problem of how do I simulate the Amon Brothers um, ele uh, electric car conversion of 1921 demonstration in uh, Denver I believe it was Colorado um, they were so successful uh, apparently that uh, when one of the Amon brothers uh, took his car into Washington DC to have it patented they immediately arrested him for stealing energy from the grid so I'm not quite sure what's going on there with that um, although if I had to take a guess um, the, my guess would be that electrical reactants likes to take energy from any voltage source it can get it from and if it's near a field of voltage it'll take it from there but if it's not near a field of voltage it will recycle whatever voltage it already possesses um, and you know just make do with what it has and make and and milk it make it extend extend it for as long as it can at the rate that it is um, designed to re, uh, re recycle it. So I've learned um, that this is a interesting phenomenon because sometimes um, the recycling rate can escalate and that causes the accumulation of energy to rise at an exponential rate and then you've got infinite gain and eventually the circuit blows up and fries itself if you don't do something to regulate and prevent that from happening. Now William Beatty was answering a question and then there were all these comments that went on back and forth between Franco and William and and I should say William is a regular contributor to electrical science so and uh, Franco is the administrator so they had a lot of comments and I realized I could answer I could respond to one of those comments by William and it because it brought to mind um, this experiment of the Amon brothers which I suspect was repeated by Tesla in his Piercero demonstration of 1931 10 years later what we little we know about the Amon brothers is that they had two bronze spheres replacing the headlights in their car and rods came down from the spheres to a steel drum and all we know about the steel drum is that they admit that there was a large winding and um, the use of iron of the steel shell of the drum and that's it that's all they told us and oh they're getting energy from the air well I I've tried so many different varieties of, s of simulating that circuit and I could never get it until now. Thank you William Beatty for this inspiring image on your Amoski, I think it's .com website. It's all in the simulation file, the various links. And he took a Tesla coil and, a cord and slightly modified it and then I went and modified it a little bit more because it didn't work as you see it here. I had to take off the primary coil and the secondary coil and I had to assume that each metal ball is hollow and that it is a spherical capacitor in which either the air alone on the inside of this sphere is acting as a dielectric or there may be a further enhancement to the charge by coating the inside of the bronze sphere with a dielectrical coating of a certain um, depth or thickness to induce just the right um, capacitance value for that sphere. And what a sphere does is it concentrates um, the charge 
on one side of the dielectric, namely the inside, in the center. And it has nowhere to go. And this is why Tesla used these spheres on the ends, because if he didn't, the energy would spew off the ends and leak out into the environment. And so this way it encapsulates it because the center of the sphere can't connect to anything. It, it's bound and it's quarant under quarantine and so it can't change its value. It can't leak somewhere. It has nowhere to go but the center of the sphere. So if anything it accumulates. It, it can't leak anywhere. Um, and then you get this ricochet effect going back and forth. And that's the point of why William drew this the way he did. Now he drew it according to a Tesla coil in which the primary, uh, two primaries on either side is charging this thing. But I found it's so much better if you take away the primaries, don't charge it with anything, at least not conventionally speaking. And the inside of one sphere, let's say it's the, the right one here, is grounded while the inside of the opposite sphere, or I should say the sphere itself, across the, sur across the depth of the sphere from interior to exterior, is charged with a very mild voltage, let's say one microvolt, that you could easily get from the atmosphere. It'll just show up. But if the other side is grounded, then the charge in th from the atmosphere will show up across uh, the the uh, shell of the hollow sphere on the opposite side. And then you run your simulation and within um, a, a little bit of a duration, a couple days, you'll end up with half a thousand volts, 450 volts across the shell of the grounded sphere. That's where you'll get the most voltage. Now, and you can regulate it based on the capacitance of each sphere. In other words, if you increase the, the capacitance, um, you diminish, I think you'd, you, no, if you increase, yeah, you diminish, I can't remember how that works. You have to go up to a maximum of 10 picofarads for each sphere. And if you go beyond that, uh, this uh, anomaly, let's say, does not work, it doesn't happen. And then the coil, you can, um, I don't know what the minimum is, but I only took it up as high as I think 10 Henry's because there is a window I think on that as well. Um, and within that window, you can get a humongous amount of voltage. I think if you decrease, what happens is if you decrease the capacitance on the two spheres, but increase within their window of capacitance, but increase the inductance on the coil to the maximum of its window, you get the maximum amount of voltage. And I was getting something like millions of volts. <laughs> it was unbelievable. It was really phenomenal. Um, and it simply climbs. It keeps climbing. See, it's the rate of climb that you can regulate, but the fact is it keeps climbing. So what I thought was, okay, if you use one of these so-called primary coils and engage it only after you've accumulated the energy. You don't engage it ahead of time, so maybe you keep this coil open, but you keep it around it. And then once you get the voltage you need, then you engage a switch across the coil, and now this primary coil becomes your motor coil. And maybe you have more than one. Have as many as you like in parallel, but you only engage them periodically in order to get energy that you need. And so you have to disengage the motor from this thing to allow it to accumulate voltage, and then you um, short out these primary coils, so-called primary, now they become the secondary, uh, and the main primary coil is this long one in the middle. But anyway, you, you close out these larger coils periodically in order to run your motors. So it's like a pulse motor, basically. Um, and um, let me think, let me think. I think the energy ricochets back and forth between the two spheres, so it's an oscillatory nature. So you would probably have to have diodes on these primary coils in order to feed a DC motor situation um, because that's what was available, I think, to the Amon brothers. Although Tesla probably, well, we're told he used an AC motor. 
So that might be why he had all those radio tubes, not because he was trying to garnish um, energy from the environment, but because he was trying to uh, create an AC oscillation uh, that was high voltage and high current, uh, and they didn't have transistors in those days anyway, to feed his AC motor. Um, and maybe it was three phase. Um, I don't know how to deal with phase, th multiple phase um, electricity very well. In fact, I don't even bother going there because it's a little too much for my head to uh, wrap my head around it. So I stick with single uh, oscillatory style motors. But you know, this is a whole area. I'm just dealing with the power supply. And I leave it to the technician to figure out the rest. Um, but I just loosely, you know, figure it out as best I can. So this is the image that inspired me. So let's see if, um, nope, wrong way. Okay, now this is the output. See, it goes in the negative. It could just easy have, have easily as gone in the positive if I had um, reverse polarity of the thing uh, when I charged one sphere. But I'm measuring the, the, capa the uh, voltage across the shell of the opposite sphere. And I'm measuring negative 454.87 volts, accumulating in two days, seven hours, 33 minutes, and 20 seconds. Ain't that cool? Now, I, like I said, I told you, I, I accumulate a whole lot more. And so it was, and you don't get to shrink the days, unfortunately. There's a certain minimum duration in, in that it just, wow, it just explodes with energy. And just like everything else I do in, in these circuits, <laughs> you don't get much wiggle room. Um, so unfortunately, you get a lot of energy, but um, I'm hoping there, there's ways to attenuate it. Um, I'm not quite, because if this is a simulation, I don't know, the real world is probably going to be different. So now this is the circuit, and here's my text, and um, making suggestion on what to coat uh, the inside, what Tesla liked to use for his dielectric uh, when he wanted to slather something gooey uh, over his coils and maybe on the inside of these bronze spheres. Um, maybe the whole interior is filled with a dielectrical material. Maybe not glass, maybe something you can pour into a mold using the inside of the bronze sphere as a mold and allow it to harden. Um, so you don't have to deal with molten glass. Um, but in this simulation, I simply take four capacitors and I arrange them in a I got this from the Buley archetype idea because that's what the Buley archetype is. It's four capacitors in a ring. But I turned them around 90 degrees, so instead of creating a ring of connection, <clears throat> putting them in series, I put them in parallel and so that their connections are radial, not um, circumferential. circumferential. <clears throat> so they go into a common center, and that's the center of the sphere. Then they go to the outside of the sphere, which is also a common conduit of a uh, pathway for current to circulate in a, well, actually only in one place. So you've got current going around in a circle up here, but then you have potential going into the center of the sphere in, in these four radial directions. And then I put the charge, the one microvolt charge, on. I select one capacitor to put it across it. And then I put the ground on the interior of the other sphere. Now I put the coil of 10 Henrys in the middle. And um, there's 100 milli ohms of s equivalent series resistance on all of eight capacitors. And there is 10 ohms of series resistance on the 10 ohm coil, indicate or suggesting to me that the wire gauge of that, of that coil is 25 aug. 25 AWG, because that's roughly about what that what will happen in that instance. So I've got all the links here that you can go to, and various admonishments, and it's basically a very simple circuit. Yet it accumulates voltage. Now there's no current to speak of; it's hardly there. So, like I said before, you I think you have to pulse, um, taking off current from this, but. Hopefully, if you get it up to a high enough voltage, um, probably more than 450 volts, um, you'll be able to pulse it more frequently. Because it's all about how much voltage you have to begin with, and then you don't take all of the current 
or I should say you don't deplete all of the voltage all at once. So you have to have more voltage than what you need in order to um, shrink down the pulse duration to, so that you take only as much current as you want and nothing more. Now in the old days, a hundred years ago, the electric cars were more like the golf carts of today and because they didn't travel very fast. Now I'm sure Tesla figured out how to get more efficiency out of this thing after 10 years of uh, st uh, studying the matter, or however long he spent, no more than 10 years, between the two demonstrations, so uh, between the Amon brothers and Tesla. So he probably was able to raise the bar and race his car along at 90 miles an hour. But the Amon brothers, they tootled around at a snail pace in, during their demonstration because that's what electric cars were capable of that were available to the common person at, in that era. Uh, they might not even, even have been as good as our golf carts, I don't know, of today. But something along those lines, basically, in which your, th your accelerator pedal, the throttle, you don't get different speeds. It's just on and off. It's, you've got one speed. And that's the way Model T's uh, operated as well, gasoline-fired Model T's of that era. Uh, you didn't have the racing capability that the more expensive cars like the Pierce Arrow was capable of and that's what Tesla selected probably for that reason <laughs> and it's also heavier so he somehow got a lot of force but anyway I'm just amazed that this thing works at all you know I don't expect you know me to come up with stuff that's fantastic in a practical sense I'm just amazed that it comes up with anything at all. I mean, my God, it's so simple. And people say, keep saying, oh, that's too complicated. Well, they can't complain that this is not, uh, this is, uh, not simple. Uh, this is uh, utter simplicity. So you don't have to use bronze spheres now, see? Because there's always an equivalent version of a circuit. And I had to make one in order to simulate it. Um, so you could just build it with eight capacitors and a coil. <laughs> And, and, but, yeah, <laughs> I mean, what else can I say? <laughs> um, now, you'll get in trouble with the FCC in all likelihood because this thing is oscillating like a radio station, uh, creating radio interference in your local environment, so you got to deal with that. you got to deal with it. Um, Tesla, I'm sure, dealt with it, or didn't, and in three years' time after his demonstration, uh, the FCC was born, so it, it's quite possible. That's why I like to think. Tesla res is responsible for the, e the, ex the birth of the FCC because he did not worry about the interference, the radio interference that his car put out. But he did take it out into the countryside. He drove it around the city and then he took it out into the countryside and revved up the speed. So while he was in the city, he may have, somebody may have reported that there was an event that occurred. I, I, you know, I don't know. I like to think, you know, conspiratorially. So that's my speculation on conspiracy theory. Um, I think that's everything I have to say about this. So there are limits to the parameters of, your, of the components in order to get this thing to flash over, you know, flash over and boom, and give you the uh, exponential rise of voltage that we're looking for as a substitute for a battery pack. And again, the amp hours may not be a whole lot in here, but I'm sure there are ways of increasing that. Maybe the hollow sphere has to be filled completely with a dielectrical material in order to have any amp hours to speak of. I don't know how to do that in a, in a, in a uh, capacitor. Well, no, wait a second. No, I do know. I should try that. Eric Dollar has said, that longitudinal energy is inversely proportional in space to the space in counter space. And I've, I kind of figured that out too on my own and verified what Eric said, but from you know a year or two ago doing other simulations. So I had to agree with, what, with that statement of his. So I'm wondering then, so, but, um, I'm wondering how to do that and not lose the 10 picofarad value on these bronze spheres. Um, maybe they are filled with air. See, I don't know. I would have to think about this. Because the resist... I'm thinking of the equivalent series resistance of a capacitor. If I drop it, 
or do I increase it? <laughs> Which do I do to get more amp hours out of that capacitor? To make it more like an electret, I suppose, or not an electret. No, no, more like, you know, a capacitor that somehow stores more amp hours. I'm not sure, but I'm sure it has something to do with the dielectric, the geometry of the dielectric, or something or other, something of that nature. Or maybe you gotta layer these things. Maybe you gotta do layer upon layer. Maybe that's why his was better. He did layer upon layer of dielectric and metal sphere, dielectric and metal sphere, down to the center, which may have been either a dielectric ball or a metallic ball or an air space. You know, there's all these ideas I, I'm just throwing out as a possibility. Because I'll tell you, the reason why I suggest la a layering, there are two examples for layering. One are spacesuits, NASA spacesuits. They are layered of paper and foil, and that protects them. It, paper and foil takes care of just about all types of radiation that can pass through a substance. Uh, there are three types of radiation, convective, conductive, and radiative. And that layering of those two substances takes care of all three types of um, transference of heat energy, or whatever you want to call it, I guess, radiation energy, um, or energy in general, caloric, whatever. Um, then the, another example is orgone, an orgone blanket, or an orgone, orgone box is the same principle. A layering of a dielectric and a conductive material in multiple layers. And usually when they tell you to do it, they say, uh, what do they say is the limit in which it, the, the gain is not that it dro starts to drop off after, what is it, three or four ply or three or four layers to make a ply? How does that? <laughs> I forget the wording on that. Um, a ply is one set. Yeah, three or four ply. Each ply has two layers, a conductive layer and an insulative layer. And I think it was three or four ply, uh, or maybe it was seven, I can't remember, that it is the most efficient use of layering. In any case, um, so I'm wondering if that will, let's see, if you layer, that means you're putting capacitors in series. Ooh. And that reduces your uh, capacitance. But if you're thickening the dielectric, that would diminish your capacitance. So it could be to offset, but you have to increase the thickness of the dielectric in order to increase the equivalent series resistance. That's what I would suspect. So to compensate that and still keep your capacitance the same, you have to layer it. Yeah, that makes sense. Okay. So it could be that it's layered. That's so it's not hollow, in at least not completely at any rate. It might be a little air gap in the middle. There might be a requirement that there be an air gap of some size, but, um, oh boy. <laughs> Maybe this is where Tesla made his improvements um, by testing out various thicknesses of the, thick, thicknesses of the shell of the dielectric layer and, um, well then, obviously, you don't need a thick metallic layer. So instead of a bronze sphere, now you do an electroplating. You can make the, the, the bronze, or you don't have to use bronze. You could use um, some other metal, let's say copper, pure copper, make it very thin as an electroplate value, and then you could get a lot of layers in there because now it's just the thickness of the dielectric that you gotta deal with for the most part and not the additional thickness of the metallic layer. So I'm thinking that's probably what was done, or what Tesla did to improve efficiency. Um, anywho, so that's my little video on this subject. I hope you enjoyed it.